good morning today is september 21st 2024 today's dan's birthday if you happen to be able to like text him or something wish him a happy birthday anyway we're continuing on in daniel and this is a fun one elaine you should remember this but it starts with a commentary the writing on the wall over the next seven years, Daniel again slips into obscurity in Belshazzar, Belshazzar's palace. Then, on the occasion of a great banquet at which there is excessive drunkenness, praise of lesser gods, and defilement of goblets taken from Solomon's temple, Belshazzar sees a finger writing something unintelligible on the wall. When Daniel is finally called to interpret it, the message is that Belshazzar's arrogance has cost him his life. As if to stave off God's judgment, Belshazzar elevates Daniel to the third highest position in his government. But by the end of the night, Belshazzar is dead. All right, Daniel 5 verse 1, 542 BC, King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king of his no and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. The king called out for the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners to be brought and so and said to these wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. O oh, king, live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, I say, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. This man, Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding, and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Daniel, then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. O king, the most, 
The Most High God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the peoples and nations and men of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and sets over them anyone he wishes. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of gold and silver and gold, and of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. This is what these words mean. Mene means God has humbled the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of Bab the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. And we have a short commentary. Who actually killed Belshazzar is not known, but presumably it was Darius the Mede. Yet that only compounds the issue because the identity of Darius is itself unclear. He is definitely not the great Darius of Persia who will come to power some 20 years later. Most speculation centers on a man by the name of Gab Gabrius or Gubaru, who is sometimes identified as an ally of Cyrus and the governor of the Gut peoples who took Babylon from the Babylonians. Whoever he might actually be, this Darius the Mede will have control of the nation for about three years before he sees his own writing on the wall, as it were, and virtually hands Babylonia over to the ascending Persian Empire. All right, and more commentary, the 77s. Sometime during the first year of Darius the Mede's reign, Daniel reads a copy of Jeremiah's prophecies. Evidently, copies have been circulating among the exiles ever since Baruch penned the last words on the third scroll 20 years earlier. Daniel is particularly moved by the recitation of Israel's sins and the 70-year exile which Jeremiah predicted. Here, in 542 B.C., Sixty-three years have passed since Daniel and other exiles were taken in the first deportation in 605 B.C. Realizing that the prophecy indicates still another seven years before the promised restoration is to begin, Daniel turns to God in prayer. Here now is his prayer in which he not only confesses his own sins, but also those of his fellow sons of Israel. And we're in Daniel 9, verse 1, 542 B.C. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last seventy years. 
So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The men of Judah and the people of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far in the country, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. O Lord, we and our kings, our princes, and our fathers are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving. Even though we have rebelled against him, we have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning our sins and turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, O Lord our God, who brought our your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong. O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away from your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy, O Lord, listen. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hear and act. For your sake, O my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. And we have commentary. One of the most intriguing passages of all scripture follows this account of Daniel's beautiful prayer of contrition. As Daniel is in his per period of prayer, he is approached by the angel Gabriel, whom he recognizes from earlier visions. Gabriel brings a message about seventy sevens, a message which apparently speaks in response to Daniel's concern about the restoration. There is general consensus that each seven represents a week of years, that is, seven years. From that point forward, much discussion has ensued. The first seven sevens, or 49 years, may well have reference to the time it will take to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, but the particular decree setting that time period into motion is much debated in light of the various decrees which will issue concerning Jerusalem's reconstruction. The second set of sevens, the 62 sevens, has apparent reference to the coming of the Messiah. The Hebrew text says there are 69 sevens, whereas the number used in most translations is 62, which may or may not simply be 69 less the first seven sevens. This would set the Messiah's coming at roughly 550, 550 years from the time of Daniel. As with the preceding weeks, the final week, or last seven years, has also been the subject of much discussion. 
Some believe it represents the beginning of the Messiah's church and the apostolic age. Others believe it foretells a seven-year period during which time God will reestablish Israel as his covenant people prior to the Messiah's second advent. What all agree on is the fact that God is working purposely in history on the behalf of his righteous ones. Daniel 9 verse 20 and it's 542 B.C. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people in your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be cut off, and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Okay, that's it for today. What a great book Daniel is. Okay, see you tomorrow. Have a great day.